It's a fascinating subject. It's also exceedingly complex. Uh, there is a fortunate today, we, we have probably some of the best experts in the world on different aspects of this subject, but I should also tell you that probably everybody on the panel, all of us, could talk on all the aspects. So what I've had to do is to divide the topic up a little bit, uh, to address it in a little bit different ways. Everybody, I think, knows everybody from the panel. I'm not going to introduce people because you can look in the bios, but what you've got here is an incredible depth of experience. Uh, and I'm going to start, we're going to start with Fadi on a general overview of shale gas. Um, Melody is then going to talk a lot about what really went on in the U.S. so people have a better idea of how complicated it was to develop this technology, but also what impacts it's having on the U.S. economy. I think people have read about it a little bit, but you don't really understand the depth of the changes that are happening in the U.S. economy as a result. We are then have Ian is going to give us a perspective of an oil and gas executive who has to worry about how do you take this technology into a country, how you de how you deal with the people, how you deal with the issues of getting it accepted. And then I'm going to end up with the Honorable Mr. Wozniak, who is in charge of trying to understand how to make it work within his country and how Poland is a little different from some other places on a geological basis and also on uh, implementing it. And then we will open it up for an inner panel discussion if there's any, but I think there's a lot of people I see here on the floor who have a lot of knowledge as well. So we will, we will definitely open it up for general discussion. Buddy, why don't you take it away? Uh, thanks a lot, and good morning uh, uh, once again. And you said there are a lot of expertise here, but I see the colleagues, there are more expertise in the floor than here, perhaps, so the, 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 definitely, so, so there are lots of experts there as well. Okay, let me just uh, try to give a, uh, the general, the broad picture uh, about the gas. First of all, some of you may know that a few years ago, we said in the, uh, our World Energy Outlook, uh, talk about a golden age of gas, that the gas is entering a golden age. And in fact, the, the name of our report was, are we entering a golden age of gas? With a question mark. Some of the colleagues didn't like the question mark, but there was a question mark because there were some conditions uh, to see a golden age of gas worldwide. For me, gas, before the unconventional gas revolution, gas was already going up, a very decent growth of natural gas demand uh, worldwide. But to see a golden age of gas, we need to see a significant growth from unconventional gas, which would, A, increase the availability of gas, and B, would make gas much more affordable for the consumers. This is the uh, important thing. So then we see uh, uh, in the last few years, we saw an increase in the United States, Canada, Australia, let's don't forget Australia, a, a growth uh, there. And uh, there, I know that there are some concerns uh, by some saying that whether or not this uh, growth is really going to happen. And I would like to uh, mention to you just one number. The, the shale gas production in the United States in the last uh, few years, about five years, reached about 200 BCM, which is the current exports of Russia. So we aren't talking about peanuts. This is real happened already. And uh, there are five major projects in Australia, and they are all going on, which would make Australia in a few years of time, uh, the largest LNG exporter of the world catching up uh, Qatar. So these are real things going on, not only uh, the slides or not on books, these are real th things uh, going on. But there is one issue, and I have colleagues here who work on the shale gas, and I am not. Uh, uh, the issue is the exploration and production of shale gas may well have some 
consequences on the environment and the uh, local uh, communities. This is for sure. And I believe that some of the concerns raised by the local communities, NGOs, some of them are legitimate concerns in terms of the issue of water, in terms of chemicals, in terms of the methane leakage and uh, all of these issues. So therefore, what I would say is that if the gas, shale gas operators would like to see a golden age of gas, they have to apply golden rules to their practices. If they do not do so, an incident may well have <coughs> unintended dramatic implications on the reputation and the viability of the shale gas. Therefore, it is very important that the right regulations are there, the strict regulations are there, and they are followed very closely by the governments, and uh, that the operators get a social license to operate uh, here. I think this is uh, crucial. So, our expectation is the shale gas will uh, grow substantially, mainly driven by US, Canada, Australia, China, and uh, other uh, uh, provinces. About the half of the production growth, we believe, in the next 20 years will come from the unconventional gas, shale gas, and also, I mean, the, the, the Australian uh, Colbert methane uh, as well. So what are the implications of this? A bit on that, and I will leave it to the uh, other colleagues. First of all, I think the traditional gas exporters will be negatively affected. So we have to be uh, clear here. Definitely, they will, uh, for example, Russia, Russia is and will remain the largest gas exporter of the world. But I expect Russia, compared to before the shale gas uh, revolution, Russia will lose volumes. And uh, second, Russia uh, will uh, have a pressure in terms of the pricing. Both the, the way of how it is priced, the, the, the gas prices, and the, the current uh, contracts will be under discussion. I think uh, the shale gas revolution was, the, uh, to me, the, uh, the, end of, the beginning of the end of the oil index gas pricing. So it will take some time to change, but it will change. It will not be the main, the, the, the pillar of the gas pricing. Another one is the implications of the, uh, on the, on the uh, economy. Uh, here, today, when you look at the uh, gas prices worldwide, the three regions. The Europe uh, uh, consumes gas more or less five times more expensive than the uh, United States, and Asia eight times more expensive than the United States. And this is a huge number, 500%, 800%. And even more striking, as I said this morning, more striking is, to me, five years ago, these prices were more or less the same. There were only one or two dollar difference between these three regions, three, ga three gas prices. And now within five years, there's a huge change. And I think the companies who uh, turned the eye of the shale gas developments, who were denial about the shale gas developments, are now suffering in terms of their business uh, strategies. And when we look at the uh, electricity prices, in Europe, electricity prices are set to be about 50% higher than the US electricity prices and about three times higher than the uh, gas prices, uh, electricity prices in China. So Europe will be, as a result of these developments, as a result of Europe not acting wisely, which I will come in a minute, Europe will be a high uh, cost energy region, especially when compared to United States and China and will, be, uh, will have significant consequences for the competitiveness of Europe with higher electricity and uh, gas prices. I am often in uh, Brussels. I discuss with my colleagues in, in, in Brussels. Uh, the, uh, the point that uh, I would like I make them is that in Europe, many colleagues think since in Europe, except for Poland, there may not be an increase on the uh, shale gas it wouldn't affect Europe. It is wrong, and it is completely wrong, but completely wrong, because it is already affecting Europe. I can give you at least three examples, and I finish there. The first one is, 
in the United States, after shale gas has started to penetrate the electricity generation in the last five years, and this is for me a phenomenal thing. Five years ago, the share of coal in the U.S. electricity generation was higher than 50 percent, and today, in five years of time, it is just a bit higher than 30 percent. So 20 percentage point down in five years in an economy like the United States. And what about uh, implications for Europe? Very substantial. What happened is that the coal, which was dominating the U.S. PG electricity generation system, left the uh, United States for exports, went several places, one of them was Europe, and collapsed the European coal prices. Okay? And since the coal, uh, carbon price in Europe is so low, many people switch to coal in Europe. I don't know if I would make a survey here where did we see the highest growth of coal consumption in the world? How would the colleagues say? But I wouldn't tell the, uh, the, uh, what the 2011 numbers show. In the year 2011, the highest coal consumption growth in the world was China, and the second to that was Europe, 7.2%, which is unbelievable. It's a historical growth, highest growth in European history. And this is mainly because of what happened in the United States, the shale gas revolution. This is the point of departure. So it means it affects everybody, even you don't have the uh, 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 production. My final point is on uh, climate change and the role of uh, uh, shale gas. In Europe, again, we, Europe is the only country or only region, EU, which has a climate policy. Okay? Climate policy is uh, designed to reduce the CO2 emissions. But when you look at the numbers in the last five years, the largest reduction in CO2 emission in the world was in the United States. Much higher reductions than it is in, in Europe. And it is mainly a natural gas replacing coal. And in Europe we have targets, we have mandates, we have legislations, and it is not happening. So therefore, uh, but I should also tell you that I don't want to be seen too close to uh, shale gas or natural gas. I have the same arm length, all the fuels. I can tell you that natural gas is, cannot bring us alone to a two degrees trajectory that we all would like to see, but can make many major uh, progress in terms of uh, reducing the CO2 emissions. So to sum up, it is a big change uh, happening, already happened and yet to happen, and it will affect everybody even you, are a, uh, you, have, you don't produce one BCM of uh, uh, shale gas, it will affect the uh, traditional gas exporters in a negative way, and it provides a major opportunity for gas importers like Turkey to have better negotiation grants with the uh, major gas exporters. Thank you. That was a great lead in and uh, talking about the complexities of this subject and some of the unintended consequences which people don't always appreciate of changing, changing developments. Uh, Melody, uh, you're going to talk some about the U.S. situation? Uh, I will. And, uh, uh, Fatih's already stolen half of my talk, so uh, <laughs> it'll be short. Um, <laughs> no. The, um, the uh, uh, natural gas in the U.S. has been a game changer. Um, I think the uh, misimpression uh, that has been uh, put out to the public is that this happened overnight. And one thing, as, as the world is looking at developing its shale basins, I would like to give you a little bit of history as to how shale gas technologies actually were developed and how much time that took. And we uh, did a future of natural gas study at MIT. Um, we worked on it for three years. Uh, Doan in the audience here was a member of, our, was one of our students on the team. Um, and, uh, and as part of that, we looked at the history of the R&D and how that worked. And it took about 20 years. Uh, it uh, started in about 1978, right after the U.S. Department of Energy was formed. 
and the federal government put a lot of money into characterizing shale basins. That was basically the sum total of its activity. It then, uh, the R&D was picked up by an organization called the Gas Technology Institute. Some of you may not know that, some of you may. Uh, the Gas Technology Institute was an organization that was essentially chartered by the federal government, but it was private dollars. It was money collected at the, um, at the uh, pipeline on volumes of pipeline gas that was to be used for R&D. Um, George Mitchell, the CEO of Mitchell Energy, was on the board of the Gas Technology Institute. He had a conventional field in Texas, had all of the infrastructure. He knew that the shales would produce and then they would stop producing, and he came to GTI and asked them to do a research project to see if they could get continuous production of the shales in that field. That field was the Barnett Shale. Um, that was about 15 years of research, um, 10, 12 million a year um, from GTI matched by industry. And so over that period of time, they developed the technologies to produce shales continuously. And um, at the same time, there was a federal tax credit for unconventional gas. Okay, that was a time-limited tax credit. It disappeared in 1992. Um, however, uh, volumes that were, wells that were already producing before 1992 were grandfathered. So you had a combination of early federal characterization, the Gas, gas Research Institute that came through and put in steady, uh, assured year after year funding, something you don't get from our federal government if you're relying on them for research dollars, assured funding over time, and a targeted time-limited tax credit. And that essentially gave, um, gave us the shale technologies that we have today. The one thing I would say, even though those technologies were developed, the floor price of natural gas in the U.S. doubled. In, in the early 2000s. So I think without the doubling of that floor price, it still would have been uneconomic uh, to use those shale technologies. But there was just a shift upward in, in the floor price of natural gas in the US. So, so it, it, it was a game changer. It was a game changer that took place over a long period of time. Let me say one other thing about the structure of the U.S. industry, which is very different than what you have in Europe and other parts of the world. The, um, I worked in the Clinton administration. The big, big gas production was super majors offshore Gulf of Mexico. The super majors left onshore U.S. in the, in the 90s, okay, essentially for a long time. And, um, and so uh, the developers of the shale technologies were the smaller independent producers onshore. They were members of the gas uh, technology, uh, gas research, and I keep confusing them because they changed their name. Um, uh, gas Research Institute, they became part of that team and that technology was transferred to the smaller independents who were the ones who then went out and developed the Barnett Shale and the Marcellus. The super majors have now come back onshore U.S. because, of, because it's incredibly profitable. Um, I think that because of the structure of the industry in the U.S. and who was doing the original production, there was not as much care taken in, in uh, drilling and the development of uh, shale gas. And so you have seen problems, environmental problems, early on in, and that I think is actually kind of naturally um, uh, diminishing as super majors come back on shore and start doing more, uh, more shale production on shore U.S. Having said that, there are environmental issues. When we worked on the, um, the Future of Natural Gas study, 19 faculty and senior researchers were involved in that study. Um, we fought for two months over whether our conclusion was the environmental issues were manageable but challenging or challenging but manageable. That's what academics fight over. We, I think we ultimately concluded that they were manageable but challenging, the, the thinking being that these are engineering issues 
they're not, it's not rocket science. We know how to manage them if we have, and we have the technologies to manage these environmental issues if we uh, have regulations that require them. So, so um, we see these as serious issues, uh, not certainly nothing to stop the development of shale in the U.S. Um, Fatih uh, mentioned uh, the, the game-changing, some of the game-changing aspects in the U.S. Um, one has been the total turnaround of a policy in the Bush administration to uh, expedite the siting of LNG import facilities. Um, I can give you data on that. It's pretty shocking. Um, that was a policy uh, in 2001. The U.S. had 2.3 BCF a day of import capacity. In 2010, we had 22.7 BCF a day. So we increased our import capacity by an order of magnitude. And last year, we imported less than one BCF a day. I did not think, so that's all sitting there. That is uh, uh, stranded assets and stranded investment. Um, based on a policy that got its information from super majors, not small producers. The super majors had left onshore U.S. a long time ago. Um, so bad policy. Uh, good luck, bad luck. We are now looking at exporting gas. I can't believe in my lifetime um, that we are doing that. I can't believe in my lifetime the shift in the generation mix. Uh, Fatih mentioned it. Um, uh, it's t uh, coal has typically been tw uh, over 50% of U.S. generation, and in 2012, gas was 31%, coal 37%. So they, and there were a couple of months this year where they were equal. So that's another shocking statistic. And then I would just, um, uh, Fatih also mentioned the, uh, the climate change um, benefits uh, of, of uh, using natural gas and generation. We looked at that in the gas study. Fundamentally, just by using our surplus NGCC capacity in the U.S., which we have a huge uh, overbuild of NGCC capacity due to another bad policy. Um, we always get gas policy wrong. Um, just by using that, we could reduce CO2 surplus, not building any new generation. We could reduce CO2 emissions by 20%. In my view, uh, climate change is a much more intractable and serious problem than the environmental issues associated with shale production. So you pick your poison, you manage your, uh, the engineering issues associated with shale production, and you get enormous climate benefit. Um, uh, two more points. There's been a lot of uh, issue, uh, numerous issues <coughs> raised about water use and shale production. Um, water use uh, in shale production compared to other uses is very, very small. And um, one thing you would find in the gas study, this is in the Marcellus, and this is a percentage of barrels of liquid. Um, for public uses in the Marcellus, uh, it's 12%. Uh, mining is 72%. That's a heavy, heavy coal mining area. Shale is less than 0.1% in terms of uh, percentage of water used. The issue that people need to understand is you use the water all at once. That's where the problem comes in. You, that's what disrupts the communities. That's what overwhelms your, your water treatment facilities. Is It's not a huge amount of water overall over the course of a year. It's just that you're using it all at once. And so that needs to be managed in a very different way and can be managed. And then let me close by um, giving you some data on the impacts of shale on the U.S. economy. Um, they expect by 2015, uh, 870,000 jobs in the U.S. will have been created. Its contribution to the U.S. GDP in 2010 was 77 billion. In 2015, 118 billion dollars, and in 2035, 231 billion dollars. Enormous contribution to the GDP, um, and that in the next 25 years. The shale gas industry will, will provide $933 billion in revenues for the state, local, and federal government. So, um, and finally, uh, it saves, in 2012, each household $926 a year, 
and, and by 2035, it'll save each household 2,000 a year. So it is a game changer in many respects. Thank you. Uh, Ian's on the other side of this now. Ian has got the responsibility of trying to get this technology into place within countries. So Ian's going to talk to us a little bit about what the issues are related to that. And I've asked him not to concentrate on the rocks themselves as much as to concentrate on the problems of getting the holes in the ground and getting their production up. <laughs> Good. I'm not a geologist, so I wouldn't want to concentrate too much on, on, the, on the rocks. But, uh, but good morning, and my, my thanks to the Atlantic Council for inviting me to, to talk to the panel today. Uh, we've heard a lot about the impact of unconventional gas and oil in the U.S., in particular in the energy world in general. So I'm not going to spend my time repeating the enormous economic and energy security benefits uh, that the development of this resource has brought. I, I think most observers don't doubt these benefits. I would like to talk about the prospects for development of unconventional resources in Europe. Um, before I do that, I, I want to stress again, I know it's been said, but just trying to understand the enormous competitive gap that's now opened up between North America and the rest of the world, particularly Europe. And the price of gas in Europe is four to five times that of the US. And this is something which I think has now been really recognized by European industrialists as they, as they realize that what they're working against, particularly in the petrochemical uh, industry. And as said before, the USA, a, a non-signatory to Kyoto, has actually achieved a greater reduction in CO2 emissions than Europe, which has uh, put enormous effort into, into this, this policy. Um, Chevron is, is, is optimistic about the geological conditions for unconventional exploration in, in Central and Eastern Europe. But it, but it is different in many, many ways from, from the U.S. Um, the, the shales in the U.S. are essentially discovered in oil field country, uh, source rock that, that exists in locations where there's been uh, you know, a century uh, uh, of uh, oil and gas exploration and, and development. So no question that the source rock was there, no question that it was hydrocarbon bearing and the petroleum systems uh, were, were working. That is, to some extent, a large extent, less true in uh, Eastern Europe. What we've targeted is a, uh, a belt of, uh, of Silurian shale that stretches from the Baltic uh, through, uh, through Poland, Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria, into the Black Sea. It may possibly extend into, into Turkey as well. But most of this area, exception being Romania principally, is, is not a petroleum uh, uh, historically, his, his petroleum producing area. So there's uh, somewhat more geological uncertainty. Uh, the, the shales are also at a significantly greater depth, uh, typically targeting three to 4,000 meters uh, in, in Eastern Europe. Uh, from an environmental point of view, that's significant because of the, the, uh, the risk of contamination of ground, groundwater from uh, fracturing itself is absolutely zero. Uh, but uh, uh, at, at, at those depths, but, uh, but it does make it more expensive and, and more, more complicated. Over the past three years, we, we've basically uh, placed our bets in, in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, we've been awarded lease exploration positions in, uh, in five countries, uh, covering some six million or so acres, and we're, I su we're probably the, the largest position of any, any company in, in Europe in unconventionals. Um, we're probably another two to three years away before we have indications that the right geological conditions really do exist. Uh, and probably several more years after that before we have any possible commercial uh, production. Uh, the pace of development in Europe has been much slower than in the US for a number of factors that really should be of some concern to European political and, and business leaders. Because if Europe is to obtain even some of the economic and environmental benefits of North America, a, a different approach to unconventional uh, exploration will be required. At a, a leadership level, in the countries in which we operate, in Poland, Romania, uh, Ukraine, there is a clear desire and vision to seek energy diversity and potentially energy independence. Uh, to some extent, this view is then shared by lawmakers and, and, and some regulators. But at, at an administrative and bureaucratic level, I'd have to say the vision is not necessarily always shared. 
uh, it can typically, in fact, does typically take two years to permit a single well, uh, one location. Uh, if we decide, having drilled a well, that the seismic and the drill, drilling data don't exactly tie up and we need to maybe deepen a well that we've already drilled down to 3,500 meters, we need to deepen it another 300 meters, we need to go through the same process again and treat it as a brand new well. Uh, the, as a consequence, well, we might have planned to drill six wells in a particular country this year. We, in fact, were only able to manage to spud two. Uh, for Chevron, I mean, we've come to terms with the different challenges that we face in exploring for unconventional resources in Europe. Uh, we, we, we undoubtedly recognize that the, the communities deserve to have comprehensive explanations of everything that we're doing, that unconventional exploration can and should be undertaken safely and in an environmentally sensitive manner. We, we do battle a great deal of misinformation. Misinformation is put out for a variety of different reasons, and, and we, you know, I could list all of the different uh, uh, groups that, uh, that uh, might oppose shale gas. There, is the, there are the genuine environmentalists who often fundamentally are opposed to hydrocarbons in, in any sense whatsoever. And shale gas concerns them because that's, even though it's an environmentally better uh, hydrocarbon or fossil fuel than, than many others, it simply, in their views, perpetuates the use of uh, hydrocarbons and therefore should be opposed on that ground. But there are many other lobbies uh, that, that represented by uh, in, in industries that, uh, that are threatened by shale gas uh, and, by, and by countries that are threatened by, uh, by shale gas. Uh, we go to a great deal of trouble to, to explain a position. Uh, we try to bust a lot of the myths that are around. We do disclose the chemicals that are used in fracking. Uh, these are chemicals that are in general use in many household products today. We're working through the uh, oil and gas, International Oil and Gas Produce, uh, Producers Association to develop data sheets on every single well, put it online, make it available to the general public so they can see exactly what we've done in every well in terms of water, sand, chemicals used, etc. We do plan for careful water management and disposal. We, we obviously explained that at depths of three or four kilometers, there's, n there's no possibility of contamination of groundwater. We, we have taken to the communities in which we operate now a, uh, a cross-section of a well uh, to, to demonstrate you know, that eight layers of steel and concrete provide an effective insulation between the well bore and the, and the formation. Uh, we work to ensure that uh, drilling sites are left as we find them and indeed generally speaking, the surrounding roads and so on have greatly improved. Uh, and of course, we explain the benefits that unconventional gas can bring in terms of jobs and, and, and energy security and, and so on. Um, we've committed long to, to the long term in European unconventional exploration. Uh, we work closely with governments and uh, uh, the, the representatives. Um, I, I do believe that national governments in the areas we're working are recognizing that they have a responsibility to, uh, to really show leadership. Privately, they are very enthusiastic about what we're doing. We'd like them to be a bit more public about that uh, and explaining to the, the populations that the benefits of gas from shale and the precautions that uh, we're taking and, uh, and perhaps allow us to move a little quicker. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Uh, we will now turn to uh, Honorable Mr. Wozniak, who has got the responsibility for Poland as a, as a top geologist of worrying about how these wells go in and, and how they should be regulated and monitored, et cetera. Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me for this distinguished panel. Well, I have to say there is nothing left for me because everything has been said before, so I was just skipping my notes, <laughs> listening to my predecessors. but. Uh, I would like to focus on some differences because we are, there is, for me, it's a unique opportunity to, to compare something with, uh, with the United States or North America and Europe. And there are obvious differences starting with the ownership of resources, which in North America they belong to private farmers, private owners. All of them, in fact, in, well, while in Europe, not in Poland only, but in Europe, they all belong to the states. 
So every single sand deposit or every single oil deposit or every single gas deposit, that's the state ownership. So it has to be managed in a way by state. It's more or less practical that, that some governments are more instrumental in doing this, some others are not. However, thus, skipping aside for a moment the differences between the US or North America and Europe, let's look at Europe. Uh, Chevron uh, uh, and other companies, we are witnessing activities of several super majors in, in Poland and throughout Eastern Europe, and also small companies. They focus on, uh, on uh, let's focus on differences we have within Europe. We are all talking, for example, for water contamination, potential water con contamination, uh, taking care of it, of course, very much, which, as a, as a subject, as an issue, is very different in different countries. When, you look, when we look at France and the Paris Basin, we certainly, most of you may know, some of you are not. I am geologist by first education. Let me explain it quickly. The, the water level, drinking water level in France is, about, is below 1,000 meters up to 3,000 meters below the surface, while in Poland, drinkable water is within the layer of 300 meters from the top. It certainly makes a big difference for any techniques applied, for any technology to be applied, and there is no reason in Poland for so focusing on water level and water drinking water protection because the shale gas and the shale as such as a formation lays down de deep down three and more thousand kilometers from the ground. So what really matters in Poland is to seal the surface and what really matters in France is to seal the bottom. The difference in techniques and in taking care of it is, is, is really fundamental. So there are a few, I can quote these examples for, 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 for hours and hours because I've just studied it throughout through the last year, but the, the differences are obvious. So we need individual uh, approach in every country, and that leads me to the very fundamental statement that <coughs> we should not look for universal regulations throughout Europe, but individual well-targeted issues which are best targeted by each country at a time, say. So the only common thing we have is oil and gas, or hydrocarbons if you wish, which appear in different types of rocks. Will it be conventional, if we call it? We call, may call them unconventional. We, can, we, are, we have licensed several companies in Poland for both conventional and unconventional, just for hydrocarbons. So this is the approach we should have. The uh, thing mentioned by, uh, by, uh, by a few speakers before was the, the uh, European Union approach or the Brussels approach to this issue. Well, I should say, in Europe, we have an elephant in the room. And we, in some countries like Poland, we, we've decided to say we have an elephant in the room. In some other countries, they do not. That's equally good. As I said, every country should say, shape its energy mix and managing its resources according to the needs, of course, meeting the environmental standards. So what should, what should we, again, about the environment, what should we focus on is rather procedures <coughs> than regulations, because it's obvious that we have to protect air, we have to protect water, we have to protect, we have to avoid noise, we have to avoid any pollution possible, but this is, this is the regulation. But how to do it and to what extent should be still left with the administration of every country. When I look to the publication of today, or yesterday, whatever, it's recommendations by, uh, and I looked at the recommendations on transatlantic cooperation, what should it focus on? And these are basically only two things. Dialogue means communication with public, and water. As I said, water as such is a different story. Communication is the issue. In Poland, we can witness different approach of local communities to, to the drilling operators, to the operators on site. Some of them are enthusiastic. For some of them, it's irrelevant. Like, for example, in the south of Poland, where we mine a lot of coal, we are still a coal-based country. Or in the north of Poland, where the people are protesting in a, in a way that we have never witnessed before. 
what is my observation after one year in an office and posting as a chief geologist of the country? The most protesters are not the local communities. The most protesters are the holiday people who have cottages, holiday cottages outside, who are escaping from the city to the, to the, to the country for two days a week or one day a week, or temporary citizens. Another observation, which is very sad, is that all legitimate protests we've witnessed and we've noticed and we've, we, we deal with are immediately after, within days, are overtaken by big international groups of uh, environmentalists who take it over, keeping aside these local protests where they are and making a big issue, which is a strange thing in Poland, in a very remote places of Poland, we can listen to Belgian, German, French speakers who are, have to be translated, talking to the villagers and farmers about the real concern they have. As I said, keeping apart the local interest, which is absolutely legitimate in some cases, just leaving them alone. So that's a different, uh, that's a very strange experience I wanted to share with you. On the <laughs> background of very general remarks I would like to make, first, prices. Uh, Dr. Birol uh, mentioned prices and divergence of prices. As you look at it, as we look at it, sorry, in Europe, is we do not compare Asia with the United States and Europe, that's your perspective, but our humble perspective is what is the spot price and the pipe gas price. That's what we look at. And this we can see flattening and smalling the divergence very, very uh, quickly. Since, uh, it's since one year so far, so it, we can hardly say it's a trend or not, but we'll see it in the future. I believe it is a trend. When you compare the prices with the United States, there is nothing to compare. Poland is paying seven times more than 4,000 cubic meters than the United States uh, spot price. Uh, now it's probably be lower because of, because of the uh, small deal with, with the major supplier of, of gas to Poland. But in, sorry. Uh, but, oh, that's not me. <laughs> <laughs> Very sorry. But we, wh what we look as a, as a good benchmark is the average import price of Germany. They, like Germans always, they note it and publish it openly every single month. And the average price, it's around about three and a half to four times more than spot price in the United States. However, and this is the pipeline price, <coughs> and the spot price is higher, European spot price, not Henry Hub, but TTF and BP, is about 40 to 50 dollars more only. While it used to be a huge difference before. So we are well, I, I certainly would like to, to support and to, to underline what has been said. Yes, there will be a tremendous impact on the market. Whenever the United States start import, exporting gas throughout the world, the f few consequences, a big chunk of it will come to Europe over LNG, a big chunk will go to somewhere else, I don't know where, but certainly if concurrently China will start producing they will not, of course, export. They don't export any much any more energy in any form, but they will stop importing. And then, again, it will be multiplied, and, and, uh, and this will, within, uh, during our generation, it will, my generation at least, it will still happen. I, I do believe in it, in it strongly. What is the purpose? We are so strongly in Poland. Uh, we are a bit different than other countries, as every country is, but, but what are the four, three major reasons we are we are looking for, for domestic shale gas is that, first of all, we would like to have a market for gas, which we don't have. We are just importing and that's it, and selling it over regulated prices. The second is, of course, security of supply. But the third is industrial development, and in very broad term. In many countries in Europe, we do not generate power out of gas. Not only because we, we are missing it, we, we have not enough of it, or it's too expensive, because that's obviously a reason, but also because the, the supplies are unreliable. We cannot double the risk. We can probably live with some shortages of gas imported from the East, but we certainly would not 
stay alive, if we, in case of shortage, we, we, we have to, to curtail supplies to the market of gas and of, and of power alike. That wouldn't be possible. Now, with reliable su uh, supplies, will it be over LNG or will it be from domestic sources, then we can, we can develop the industry for, for power generation over gas and all, others, all other industries, of course, alike. So, well, there will be a session of questions, I understand, but again, we have an elephant in Europe. Please do remember, and this elephant can appear in the times to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that uh, lays a good groundwork for opening up for discussion. I, I would have two questions I would like to have the panel address a little bit, because I think you got a feel right away that at the EU level, and we have the same problem in the US at the federal level, there are, bit, there are broad regulations in place for how you go about the oil and gas business. And I think the EU has pretty well agreed that most of the rules that they have are, are appropriate and in pretty good place, and they're turning it over to the individual countries and nations to write the detail rules, at rules. And I think you've got a good explanation already of why each nation needs to do that. So my question to you is, how, how is it coming along in writing the individual regulations in the various nations uh, to, to deal with the oil and gas, and especially the unconventional gas production and, and oil production if it's available? Because uh, that, that is a long process in its own right. And the U.S., state by state, this is being done as well. And there are differences between states, just like there will be in Europe. But how is that? Is that process coming along, or, and is there a need for additional uh, assistance in doing that because of the complexity of the issues? Uh, anyone of you like to tackle that one? Ian, do you want to? Yeah. At, at an EU level, I think they've, they've taken the view that during the exploration uh, phase of, of uh, looking for shale gas and oil, uh, the regulations are adequate. And uh, uh, for the time being, I think they've made it clear that they haven't said they're going to leave it to the local countries. That would be very unlike Brussels. Um, what, they, what they've said is, is that uh, they, they, they will want to uh, get involved in regulation at, at a later date. Our approach in the, uh, in the different countries in which we operate has been to sponsor uh, uh, seminars uh, that uh, invite uh, over academics and regulators, particularly from North America, uh, to, uh, to, to speak and to uh, start to work with local regulators. And I believe that uh, in all of the countries we're working at, they are beginning to build uh, knowledge uh, uh, about, about this and uh, develop uh, a regulatory framework. We want these countries to develop robust regulatory frameworks. We want them to be able to demonstrate to the, the populations that they have this in place and it's effective. Uh, is very much in our interest. Yes. No, I think the question in Europe is not there. I'm sorry. I think the question is a political issue in Europe and many key countries where people think there is shale gas deposits are, took a political stance, France, Germany, uh, uh, Bulgaria, and it is uh, already banned. So we are not uh, in, the, in the situation where we are discussing this type of regulation, strict regulation or not, the question is whether or not it is at all allowed to produce, live as and produce, uh, explore uh, the shale gas production. In France, where I live, it is now there's a shale gas ban without knowing if there is really shale gas or not. This is crazy. So <laughs> you don't know, you ban something which, the, which you don't know if it exists or not. So, but uh, it is France's uh, now, uh, there are uh, very strong uh, voices in France, and uh, there are discussions whether or not to relax that ban and to, to look at the, uh, some alternative options. And there are very strong voices within the French government. So the, the question is, uh, for me, it's a political issue in Europe, uh, whether or not shale gas is considered as a sustainable energy source or not. It is uh, where we are there, unfortunately. And this will, every day, the Europe takes this position, continues with this position, is uh, 
becoming a disadvantage for the European economy vis-a-vis -vis mainly uh, US economy. I wouldn't be surprised in a couple of years of time some key European industries, heavy industries, would leave Europe and look for other destinations for uh, reallocation. Um, a few things about what's going on in the U.S. Um, uh, New York has banned, the, uh, is talking about state regulations, New York has banned um, uh, shale production and fracking, although I think that the governor looks at the numbers that I just read and would really like to see some revenues generated for, for the state of New York. So they are working through that in New York, and I think ultimately that ban will be lifted. The federal government is, has, in my view, kind of inexplicably um, uh, decided that it is going to uh, uh, regulate methane emissions uh, at the production stage. Uh, that I think that was generated by a study coming out of Cornell that suggested that, um, that uh, natural gas was worse uh, CO2 emitter or uh, greenhouse gas emitter than coal. Uh, and so EPA got into action and is going to regulate uh, methane emissions in production. Uh, that doesn't go into effect until 2014 or 2015, and I don't think it will have a major impact. The industry knows how to capture it. Uh, uh, there are technologies to do it. It's not hugely expensive, um, so that's not a problem. They are also looking at uh, water contamination. The existing laws, federal laws that regulate water tend to regulate um, for continuous contamination of water. And again, as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, with fracturing, it is episodic. And so the, the existing laws don't really cover the type of um, uh, water contamination you might get, and so they are looking at that. That's another 2015 uh, date. And um, in the gas study, we, we, didn't, we didn't pick and choose between federal and state. The industry wants state. Um, uh, the environmentalists want federal regulation. We do see a need for regional regulation because, because there are regional water basins that have nothing to do with states. And so, so um, I personally think we'll end up with more federal regulation. Uh, rather than have me ask more questions. Can I? Oh, go, sorry, yes, yes. I want just to have a short notice on what's, what's uh, what are the state of play in the European Union. Not in the European Commission, but in the European Union. There are two levels of discussion. First, you know, on the parliamentary level, European parliamentary level, very vivid discussion. And the second, strange to say, on the European Commission level. And this, again, this is one subdivision. The second is vertical. Of course, there are proponents and opponents. And there is a series of documents called reports, which are, it looks like kind of competition. We have two competing uh, groups over the, in the parliament. One is gathered under ITRE, industrial and transport and, and uh, including energy. The second is environment and climate. And they compete over reports. So everyone, every single report which is issued by one committee is immediately counterweighted by the report by another committee. But the discussion is still levelized. I, say, I, I should say it's counterweighted. The same description applies to the Commission, where we have Directorate of Energy, which is pretty much in favor of any energy developments in Europe, saying we don't need any special regulations, let's leave it under the Lisbon Treaty as it is. Every country has a sovereign right under Article 9, 194 and 192 of the treaty to shape their mix as they wish. And the environment on the opposite side, the environment and climate, which, which is saying, no, we, should ne we need a new regulation over unconventional, unconventional gas and oil. The discussion is, as I said, on both levels and between the parties, is pretty much counterweighted so far uh, and is us going. But what is certainly a, a should be a certainly a target is the exchange of good practices. We can learn in Europe 
we can be taught by Americans, but I think also Americans can be taught by us. I do remember, you've mentioned chemicals which you, which Chevron displays every single well is drilled. That's the thing which is a formal requirement in Poland since 60 years. Every single chemical used over during, dr when drilling, should be disclosed, should first by name, second by volume. And this is the precondition to have a drilling permit. And that's not a new invention. That's the thing which we've followed since years. And I would like to stress that the first drilling well for oil was done in Poland, in Carpathian Mountains, 157 years ago. <laughs> so we have kind of record of this. Thank you. Okay, at this stage, I'd like to open it up to the uh, room. There's one, one question. Yeah, I see a number of hands, so we'll, we'll get to you all. Go ahead, sir. Yes, Amit Mo from Eco Energy Israel. Um, I'm not, uh, no, I don't know if you are aware, but uh, Israel has more oil than Saudi Arabia, and I'm not uh, kidding. Uh, this is in the form of non-conventional oil in the uh, form of oil shells. So I'd like to open the discussion possibly. Uh, more than 400 billion tons of oil shells, more, uh, still not uh, under, these days under demonstration in in-situ technology in which you hit in a similar way to a production of uh, Tarsen and Olsen in Alberta and Canada drill to the layers 200, 300 meters of, of, of the rock and uh, heat the rock for, uh, after three months, the oil started pouring, so it's 60% oil, 40% gas. It's not shale gas, it is shale oil and the uh, oil shells and gas which is being uh, produced. The major problem, uh, with we run a study about 35 to 40 dollar, most likely uh, break even, price of barrel of oil of production, very high uh, cost of production. The major problem is uh, NIMBY, not in my backyard problem to develop those resources in the area not so far from Jerusalem uh, and, and so on. Also the Palestinian uh, Authority has such uh, l large resources. So basically the issue uh, for discussion, the development of non-conventional resources, not only or, uh, gas, but possibly oil and the possibility that due to domestic uh, public debate, th those resources will never be utilized. John, can I just comment on that? Uh, yes, in, go ahead. In, in one sense. W one of the challenges we face in explaining to the public about why oil, shale oil or shale gas is safe is that they think about shale in Canada, which is mined just below the surface. It is then essentially uh, cooked and the, and the oil extracted. And it's probably not, well, there's no question that it's from a greenhouse gas perspective, it's not, as, uh, it's not a user-friendly uh, uh, process. Oil from shale and or gas from shale in, in North America or in Central Europe is completely different. It doesn't involve any of this process, but it is something that we continually have to explore. I think uh, the, the majors are probably going to stay away from further uh, involvement in uh, shallow shale development. Thank you, Ian. We well, had another question over here. Uh, there's two of you over there, but go ahead. Uh, Matt, you go. Thank you, Matt Burris, U.S. National Intelligence Council. I was wondering if the uh, panelists could talk uh, about the prospects in China. Uh, particularly as we hear, you know, I'd say um, contradictory analysis, you know, uh, I think earlier the IEA was fairly optimistic about the prospects. A lot in America are not for the reasons that shale formations are different, there are the problems on the water side in China, and also, of course, uh, just it takes, uh, as we've heard here, uh, quite a bit of time actually to develop the, the specific technologies for that particular formation, so. Um, I'm Obi Moore, based in Geneva, an Atlantic Council board member. Um, I, I'm, I'm interested in the, uh, from an investor's perspective, the prospects for uh, economic and pricing model for development of shale gas. Um, given the, take the U.S. by comparison, given its geographically dense 
public grid system. To what extent is your pricing and uh, business model for developing shell gas in Europe um, deterred by the additional cost to tie in to the, what I believe are considerably less dense uh, grid systems? Excellent, excellent questions. Uh, why don't we first talk with the China question and then move on to the infrastructure requirements and the impact on the cost and the profitability of the business. First of all, before going to China uh, production, let me tell you something about China consumption. In the world, the uh, natural gas has about 25% share in the energy mix of a, a, any country on average, in Europe, in the US, in many developing countries. And in China, it is today only 4%. Very, very low compared to the entire uh, world, uh, more or less. And in the 11th five-year plan, and for China, five-year plans are very crucial. 11th five-year plan, Chinese government has two major objectives. One, to put a cap on coal, and second, to increase the production of uh, shale gas. And they not only said that, that they want to increase the production, but they put subsidies on the production of uh, uh, shale gas. And I think they are very handsome amount of subsidies if they are produced. And this is definitely be a major incentive. But it is very, very new in China, the shale gas development. The companies are just starting, exploration work is just happening. Therefore, our expectation is around 2020, in the next seven, eight years, there will not be a major growth in the shale gas and coal bed methane production in China, but after 2020, it may increase substantially the, the uh, shale gas and coal bed methane production in China. Having said that, we believe China will remain a gas importer uh, despite this growth because the consumption is very, very strong, especially in the coastal region. I'll take the moderator's uh, prerogative saying I just spent three days at a meeting with GTI in China, specifically on shale, uh, where the producers were all there, everyone was there. I think you summed it up very well, Matt, the, the, and it, so did Ruddy. It's, it's, it's off in time. Uh, they're just drilling their first wells. They have much more complex geological structures. They have tremendous problems with the Indian subcontinent moving over, pressing against the China continent, which is causing different stress levels, which means they have to, the, the service contractors are having to combine all new technologies in order to how to frack, because when they frack, they get different structural breaks in the rocks. It will happen, but it is not something that uh, their plans, which talk about big production in two or three years, I think that's going to get stretched out, but they're going to go after it, and uh, it's going to take some time. But, it, but they have such an incentive, as Fadi points out, that they're not going to give up on this one. They're, they're willing to, uh, to spend the effort. Well, to address Obi's question, uh, it's, it's a big factor. The reason why uh, Central Europe is attractive is it's in the market, uh, in the middle of the market, and uh, crisscross with pipelines and so on. Uh, Europe still has a, a long, uh, quite a way to go to, to really integrate its gas market across the countries, but that's what makes Europe attractive. I dare say the source rocks and shale in Saudi Arabia are probably very prospective, uh, but the, the, the economically they're not going to be very attractive. Uh, so, so it does have a you know, proximity to market or ability to, uh, uh, to, to, to sell your product is critical. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay. All right. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I, I wanted to, um, I, I understand that the infrastructure uh, is not as well developed and not integrated, <clears throat> but the, the EU 2020 by 2020, the, the policy on renewables suggests that you're going to probably need gas generation for backup anyway. Um, because you need gas generation to back up intermittent renewables. And so there's an incentive there to, to develop uh, a, a gas infrastructure in order to back up your renewables. 
and and uh, we've been looking a lot about the a lot at MIT at the issues of intermittency and the requirements for natural gas backup in order to do that. So if you meet those renewables goals, you're actually going to drive some gas demand or, or uh, certainly gas peaking demand in order to do that. And, um, and uh, I, I wouldn't, the, the uh, use of uh, natural gas in the U.S. has naturally gone to electricity. I'm not sure that that's where it would go everywhere either might not be the best place, uh, best use of gas, so. Yes. Yep, you're I don't have an overview of all, all business <coughs> models we can witness in Poland because as we have 19 companies from all over the world investing. No one producing yet, but the, the simple question I was asked by my students, well, we are not talking about it, it's price. It's just price. When you invest in the stock of the super major, where would you like him to invest? Where the market dictates the price of $100 per thousand cubic meters, or 400 That's a good invest in incentive, if I may say so. Of course, there are infrastructures, sorry to say that <laughs> so cynically, but that's, that's the fact. That's strange that students are needed to ask this question, but anyway, that happens. Now, the infrastructure is not so bad in Europe because we've, I've just looked into my figures, which I noted. In the United States, you, on average, you have 35, 32 kilometers of transmission pipeline for gas, over 1,000 kilometers, square kilometers, while in Europe, you have 50. However, locally, especially in Eastern Europe, of course, there is missing infrastructure, and there is an ongoing debate what to do with the gas extracted on the spot. Will it be better to send it to the grid or just to use it on the spot and produce, for example, power or heat and power better? So I strongly, strongly support what, was, what you've said just about different, different uh, ways of using this force. As I said, we don't have any production well in Poland. We expect it next year, late next year or even later but not yet, so this is just theoretical remark, not a real thing. Ask me one year later from today, I will be more clever, thank you. We're getting close to running out of time. Uh, is there any or more questions? If not, I wanna thank the panel, and it is time to move on to the next break. <laughs> <laughs>